All right, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the 37th Occam Lecture. Uh, and uh, uh, I will hand over to Professor Art Louis to introduce the speaker today. Thank you, Alex, and very nice to see so many people here. It's a great pleasure to welcome Ilya Neumann here today. Um, Ilya is a very distinguished um, professor. In fact, he's, a, he's the Charles, I forget the exact language, some Sean Chandler Dobbs, a very fancy sounding distinguished professor at uh, Emory University. So, Ilya um, won the 1991 Belarusian Physics Olympiads, which is, if you know anything about Olympiads in Eastern European countries, you know that's no mean feat. Um, he then went on to study uh, physics in Belarus, then moved to the U.S., um, eventually did a Ph.D. in 2000 at Princeton, and a postdoc in Santa Barbara, one or two other, worked, worked for a while at Los Alamos before he started um, his projects at Emory University. And we're very pleased to have him here speaking about biology. And for those of you that are physicists, I want to give you some idea about why physics might be important for biology. So very clearly, living matter is something completely different from non-living matter. You know, it moves, it replicates, it dances. It's absolutely fantastic. It's out of equilibrium. Well, equilibrium is death, right? So it's out of equilibrium. It's a very complicated non-equilibrium system. And if you talk to any biologists, they will tell you that biology is very complex. Um, and um, we know the title here is different. It's the opposite of the typical bio biologist picture. And the reason why I think it's complex because biology is complex, lots of details that you need to learn. My father is a botanist and his knowledge of tropical plants, Ga um, Gabonese rainforest plants is extraordinary, but every single plant is slightly different and it's a difference that makes things interesting. But physicists, we like to think about things that unify, things that, are, that come together. And I think the kind of idea we're thinking about and, the, and that Ilya is one of the leaders in is could it be that the kinds of things that make us alive are some kind of emergent properties? So you can think of many different levels of emergent properties. A very simple example would be water, right? So one water molecule is not wet. Two water molecules are not wet. Three are not wet. But you put enough of them together, this property of wetness emerges. Now, I just gave the example of water, but actually many different liquids are wet. So the property of wetness is not a property of the individual molecules themselves, but some collective property that they together conspire to make. And the idea is that life, things that make things alive, is somehow linked to these kinds of properties. Many different details at the lower instantiation um, may be important if you're interested in details, but at some meta, meta, meta level, there's an emergent property that may be simple. And that's what we're hoping we can hear about today. Ilya, thank you. Thank you very much, Alex and Art for Introducing me and thank you everybody for coming here. I know it's you know, it's it, it's late. You have other things to do, so I'll I'll try to to take some time. Um, so anyway, uh, the talk is about emerging laws of physics and biological simplicity. And yes, you kind of stole my punchline. <laughs> 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 but, but that's uh, but I start. You know, all of a sudden laid out high lot too. But I want to have the last slide first, just to make sure that I acknowledge people who have done. Uh, most of this of this work. Uh, so in my group, it's uh, Audrey, for example, faculty at Georgia Tech, Mia and Vijay Kuzum of Carolina at the faculty, and collaborators David and his postdoc Wave, and a few other others who did this I talked to the last year or so on this talk. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that I introduce you know, what it is that I actually do uh, when I'm not thinking about just more philosophical things, but more concrete things. So what we do is we focus on how biology processes information and learns, and this is, could be about neurons and brains, it could be about populations and evolution, it could be about individual uh, cells and how they respond to signals and you know, do morphogenesis, for example. What are the limits to this information processing capability? What are the computational physical principles that underlie this? And some examples, pretty pictures of what we have worked on. This is a, a mammary uh, duct developing in a mouse and the terminal bud at the, at, the, at, the, at the right end of it. It shows collective sensing, which we discovered and analyzed. And yeah, we talk and talk about this. This is when you cut your finger and the finger turns pink, it's because um, a certain type of signaling is activated in FKPB signaling, and we investigated how much information actually gets transmitted through this signaling pathway in the same units, in the same bits as you would investigate information transmission on your cell phone or you know, over Ethernet and so on and so forth. 
Uh, we also work on learning in different animals. This is a worm. Turns out that worms do the same thing that Pavlovian dogs do. They don't salivate, but they still learn conditional associations. And we just recently figured that out. And more may be excitingly, this is a bird with headphones on this bird. And so uh, we play different songs to this bird and bird, and we uh, teach this bird's new, bird's new songs or the updated songs. And we can predict how they're going to learn and things like that. And so over dinner, I'm very happy to talk about any of those things if you are, if you are interested. Uh, I'm, I'm sure most of the questions are going to be about headphones and the bird, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so, um, so I'm a physicist, very unapologetically. I'm a physicist even though I'm partial in the biology department. And so the question is, why should physicists study life uh, and specifically brains? I mostly work on neuroscience. And so my take on this is that, you know, studying other things that physicists study, you know, studying string theory cannot just be more exciting than studying brain that can study string theory, right? And that was precisely the, the, the train of thought that I had when I decided to switch from string theory to biophysics somewhere in the middle of my graduate school. Um, and so, of course, I wasn't the first one, uh, right? The, the um, most famous thing that, you know, when we think about physics and biology, the book that comes to mind is What is Life by Schrodinger. I'm sure many of you have read this. So uh, here, there he actually pointed out what he as a physicist and what I as a physicist actually want to find in biology. Yes, we can uh, figure out how terminal buds grow, but this is the common laws of physics that we already know. Molecules move like physical objects, right? What I'm interested in is doing what Art has told us is to figure out other laws of physics that we still do not know, but which must be somewhere in biology because we would like them to be there in biology. That's we we keep on looking and maybe we'll find something. Right? And so that's my goal is to figure out other laws of physics. Right. So and to me, law is an interpretable pattern. It's a simplicity. It's you know you you get a bunch of different experiments and they are all similar in some particular way. They are simpler than they could have been. Right. Um, so here are a couple of examples of how old works, old laws work in biology. Right? These equations, which many of you may recognize as basically um, Ohm's law applied to a certain patch of a membrane in a neuron, these are actually papers of Hodgkin and Huxley, 1952 Nobel Prize winning paper on modeling uh, signal propagation and action, action potential propagation in um, in axons. This could have easily been an undergraduate physics or, or lower division graduate physics textbook. And that's real old style, sort of old laws, which we knew from 19th century, applied to understand a certain specific uh, physical context. And it works, right? Biology doesn't have a life force underneath. You apply enough physics, enough details, you will figure it out, right? So it all works. It works great until it doesn't anymore. And the reason why it doesn't is that it gets overwhelmed by complexity of biology. So these are slices, this is uh, actual reconstruction through microscopy uh, of a patch of a brain in a mouse, if I remember correctly, right? So all of these cables are there in one particular mouse, right? And clearly in that mouse is long gone. So in a different mouse, those cables are going to be slightly different. And uh, how can we make sense of it, right? Uh, this is an individual cell. This is from our work. This is a gene regulatory network around a certain gene MIC, which is a proto-oncogen. Yeah, you know, we humans have it expressed about the 12 weeks of gestation. It's like a global regulator of growth. If it's on, if the whole body is growing, right? If you have this gene expressed when you are adult, you have cancer, right? And so that's why people are interested in trying to figure out what goes on around it. And you kind of look at this now, these pictures are even more detailed. This is from 2006, 2005. And I don't know what to do with this. I look at this particular, at this picture, this are all the different genes that interact with me. Is there promote make or it promotes them and I just I like I, is there going to be an equation for every one of these particular errors and then I'm going to have like my friends in Vanderbilt say they've coined a new unit called the Leibniz which is an Avogadro number of differential equations right and so that's what we are going to be uh, dealing with if we try to describe this so at some point it stops working um, and so this is modern biology where we're trying to understand everything. We're trying to map everything in biology. And I think it's best described by this uh, Borges's uh, short story on the executive in, in science that in that in, in, in empire, College of Cartographers involved, evolved a map of empire that was at the same scale as the empire and coincided with it point for point. Uh, in the Western desert, tattered fragments of this map are still to be found 
shelter in occasional beast to better, and otherwise we forgot about those maps, right? I mean, I, now I can realize I should have put a very similar uh, Lewis Carroll's um, story here, given that I'm speaking here rather than Borges, but it's okay, the same story, right? Um, and this is, in fact, what you start getting today mostly in biology. So all sorts of different atlases where in every single cell in a mouse brain, you figure out which genes are expressed, where they are localized, and this is a treasure trove of data. And then again, I look at it and I have no idea what to do, right? Just this unbelievable amounts of data. And in fact, I'm not the only one, right? So uh, Sid Brenner, who is one of the founders of molecular biology, it's a Nobel Prize for C. elegance development, right? Uh, his, in his 2000, uh, I think, one or 2000 essay, he said that, you know, biological research is in crisis. We're drowning in the sea of data and searching for some theoretical framework uh, with which to understand it, right? And I think that is now even more true 20 years after that publication than it was then. We are still measuring data and we do not know what to do with it besides just calculating all sorts of correlations and declaring success. Right? And sometimes those correlations actually are useful. This is how drugs get developed. You kind of do something and then figure out that, oh, this is what happened later, and so then, then you get a drug. But, but we don't have understanding. So one of the examples, just as a side note, what we work on, uh, things like Azempic, where um, we now know that it you know, results in astonishing um, um, loss of weight, right? It's a great drug. It's approved everywhere. And we still kind of don't know why, right? If you ask it, uh, real, you know, the endocrinologists just a few years ago, they would suggest that its action would be the opposite, right? And and still the current paradigm would suggest that the action should be the opposite. And why does it happen? We don't know. It's somewhere in that zoo of interactions that haven't yet been worked out, even though we have so much details right, about things that are going on. So, okay, I told you that biology is uh, complex, right? Laws fail. Why it is that I even believe that that there should be new laws, that there should be simplicity. And the point is that we all exist, right? We are here. We have been born without knowing how to walk. Our immune system was, when we were born, was, you know, very naive. It didn't know what, what, what the world is, right? And the fact that we are able to grow into functioning adults, that our immune system is able to protect us, and all of these things, they tell us that biology is simpler than it could have been, right? If I had to uh, if my brain had to pull on every single motor neuron in all different possible ways to figure out how it affects me when I'm trying to move my muscles, there would not be a time in the universe to try all of these combinations, right? So it has to be simpler, otherwise we would not be able to function, right? And um, where would the simplicity come from? That again, you know, I like good quotes. This is one of the most famous ones in this type of fields uh, from, uh, from Phil Anderson. More is different. Right? The idea that when you're putting into things together, you get this emergence of new behaviors that you wouldn't otherwise see, like molecules of water giving you wetness as, 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 an, as a scale of behavior. And so, in fact, this is kind of how it works in physics. Um, so what we try, sorry, before we go into figuring out how this emergent laws would emerge in biology, let's step at one step back and try to figure out how we get laws in physics, right? And so here is this cartoon, right? You have molecules of some gas. They are running around. They have various different velocities, right? I can write down a joint probability distribution of how likely it is that this molecule is moving in this way, that molecule is moving that way, this molecule is moving that, that way, and I'm going to have this function on an Avogadro number of variables, right? But we also know that this system is fundamentally much simpler. Uh, at some point, this gas moving around is going to give us hydrodynamics, which is described by Navier-Stokes equation, you know, something that is much simpler than that, which just has one degree of freedom, uh, well, continuous, so it's actually many, but nonetheless, one coarse grain degree of freedom velocity of a fluid, right? And we can talk about velocity of a fluid rather than velocity of each individual particle. So what we do is we put a block around this and we coarse grain. We say that we are going to approximate the joint probability distribution of all of these velocities with just a, a statement that this there is a distribution of this u variable of the ag ag average velocity over this volume, which I think I should have, uh, yeah, yeah, I have it here, sorry, I don't see the red light, so this pointer is kind of pointless for me. Um, um, and then you would say that the um, other velocities are basically independent given that you know that average velocity, right? Once I know the velocity, I know everything there is to say about correlations of molecules. The molecules only 
are correlated to the extent that they are in the same volume and therefore are part of the same average velocity, right? So I'm taking my big probability distribution that could have been on an Avogadro number uh, of parameters, so it's unbelievably large, unbelievably complex system, and I'm simplifying it. I'm saying that it's going to be just distribution of velocity, average velocity, times a product of independent terms, right? And that's if you go back to your um, thinking in... Uh, in um, you know, what the physical laws that we learn in mechanics and electrodynamics and so on are, they all have the same form, or not all, but most of them, like solid body motion, etc. They have the same form that somehow we decided that not every molecule in the body is independently important, but it's the um, some average velocity of the body, and then all of the other molecules can be predicted from that, right? That's what those predict that product terms mean. In biology, this doesn't work that way. So this is a picture um, from this work. Um, um, uh, this is a mouse. A uh, mouse is on a ball, and uh, the scalp has been removed, and there is a glass there, and they're optically recording all uh, a big part of the, of the hippocampus of this mouse. Right. And um, so the mouse runs on a, in a virtual maze. It's running on a ball, making left turns, right turns, seeing various different things inside it, and, and they can record everything that goes on inside this mouse. And you've seen this flickering here, right? Um, the point is that there is all of the things that went into making this approximation uh, above do not exist in biology. We had to assume that uh, velocities, that this, this distribution are in some sense local, that things are close to each other, are going to like uh, act like each other, right? Velocity in the same of particles in the same point in space is more or less in the same direction. Here, neurons are flickering everywhere across this very different distances. Why? Because there is axons that connect them over sometimes a meter long length. Our longest axon goes from our, our spine to the tip of our toes, right? There is no locality in the brain to speak of. There is no homogeneity, uh, meaning that every neuron is actually different from each other compared to molecules of water. So simple averaging is probably not going to be a good idea. There's also no symmetry. If you look at the, uh, all of these neurons, they are neither homogeneous nor they are on a lattice. They're just sprinkled with some weird structures between them, and we can actually understand some of the, about these structures, right? So all of the things that go into traditional ways, how theoretical physicists looking at experimental system cores grain it, they just don't work in biological systems like this one. And we want to say something about systems like this. In which sense are the system simple? Can we even detect whether they are or not simple? And so what we need to do is we need to figure out how to build these effective models, right? How to look at the system, look at the recordings, and understand that there is a lower dimensional, simpler model, and to actually build it, right? So, of course, we're not the first to try this. Um, and uh, one of the first papers that I want to sort of promote is by Astrid Prince and, and Yves Marder. What they noticed at some point, they were working on a lobster. And the lobster chews with its stomach, right? It has teeth inside the stomach, it eats, and then it just chews the food with the stomach, right? And there inside its stomach, it has a, a pattern generator, a set of neurons, you know, three or four neurons, depending how you exactly distinguish them, which um, uh, generate a periodic rhythmic contraction of the muscles in this. Right? And so they tried to build a very detailed biophysical model, accounting for every parameter that they could measure, all the conductances of the membrane. So watching Huxley-style equations, models of these neurons. And what they realized is that very different values of parameters, these are two different parameter values, like parameters on the one side shown by bars and parameters on the other side, give the same neural activity. Right? So it's this point that, again, Art made, that you can have two different liquids, water, and something else, and you still get wetness, right? Same microscopic behavior coming from a very different set of parameters in this system. And in fact, in later work, what they've done is they experimentally and computationally having this model, they could actually infer all of these parameters and point out that there are like these big manifolds, and this will become useful later, these big manifolds in, this, in the space of parameters where on every point in this manifold, the behavior is exactly or almost exactly the same. Right? So you can be anywhere on this manifold and you will get the same microscopic theory, even though you have very different microscopic parameters here, 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 or there. Right? Uh, this required for them to actually have a theory, a model first, with all of the parameters known, 
right? Or knowing what effect these parameters have, and then just checking what if I change this parameter, what happens to the output, right? So they were in this very enviable situation where their system was complex, but not complex enough so that they could actually do this thing. And then they, they would see, oh, we start from the most complex model and we realize that there is this underlying simplicity where not that nothing matters, right? Sometimes biologists make fun of physicists saying that we believe that details don't matter. No, that's not true. Some things matter and they matter quite a lot, right? But some others don't. It doesn't matter where you are on the line, but you better be on the line. Right? If you want to have the, um, uh, the certain, certain spe 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 specific type of behavior. So that's what you can do if you have a model. Right? But what if you don't have a model? Is there a model independent way of figuring out that there exists a simpler theory underlying this weird complex biological system? So that's what I want to focus on in the next maybe 5-10 minutes. So this is how data actually looks like. Right? Uh, so this is a recording. I actually forget which animal it was. I pulled it out from one of our papers, but I forgot which one, right? And so what you have here is uh, a bunch of neurons, a couple of hundred of neurons, and over here this is time, and every time you see a dot, this was a spike, this active action potential inside each individual neuron, right? So it's zeros and ones. But I also could have told you that, you know, so this is neuron and time, right? I also could have told you something else. I could have told you that this could be a single neuron and I show the same movie to this fly, and at different presentations of this movie, different repetitions of this movie, that single neuron fires at slightly different times. And the data would still look like this big table, right? That now it's going to be time and the repetition, right? Or I could have told you that this is a, um, a, a sequencing of some species in some microbiome, and every time you see a black dot, this is where a mutation is. And so there is a bunch of different species, like, you know, if let's say we're talking about COVID, my, my, many different species of the, same, of the same organism, and one instance has mutations here, another instance has mutations there, you would still get the same type of a plot, right? Or it could have been uh, something like this is a cell in, in, your, in, in your body somewhere, and cells have genes active or inactive, and so uh, this is a gene ID horizontal, and the dot means that this gene is active in this particular cell, which is vertical, right? So almost all data looks like this. I'm focusing on neural data, but if at the end we have time, I'll show you that the same ideas actually other people have done, have worked out in other domains, precisely because data looks very similarly. The structures of data look very similarly in, in, many, in many experiments today. And so what you see in all of these experiments is this very interesting observation that there is something called the Zipf's law. So if I look at this particular sequence and I, let's say, look at a, at a particular uh, uh, cut through this, through this thing, you know, over here, right? I can view it as 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, right? <clears throat> and so this becomes a word. And I can count how many times that did this word occur in my big entire data set. And I'm going to plot the first word first, the second word the most common second, the third most common one third, and so on. So I'm going to plot the rank, like the how, how frequent this word is, versus uh, the frequency of this word, right? And so what I observe is something that looks like this, where um, rank versus frequency, this is on a logarithmic plot, it means that the frequency is inversely proportional to the rank. It means that the tenth most common word is one tenth as common as the first most common one. Hundreds most common word is one hundredth time you know less common than the, the most common one, and so on. And these are different approximations, different models, but you see sort of this one over r, uh, one over rank behaviors in all of the different data sets that I'm showing you here. On the left, this is sequencing of antibodies in a whole blood sample of a, a juvenile zebrafish. Uh, in the middle, this is uh, activity of salamander retina, many neurons in the salamander retina. On the right, it's a single neuron over time in a fly when it's flying in the weird, you know, acrobatic maneuvers. And then the bottom there, this is sequences of uh, uh, two different proteins and HIV uh, from the same individual somewhere in Boston, right? And you see this one over the zip flaws. And you see them everywhere. You see them in gene expression, in chromatin, chromosomal accessibility, cell mechanics, microbiome composition, and so on and so forth. And so 
Uh, there's this long debate about what zip flow is good for, does it mean anything, and so on and so forth. And so what I would try to argue in the next few slides is that zip flow is, it tells us something about the simple and system. And it's in fact, it tells us that there is an underlying simple law. Or maybe not that simple, but there is an underlying law, right? And so, um, which connects, which we underline microscopic law in this microscopic observation. So that's what I will try to explain. First, I'm going to give you a, couple, a bit of history about the zip flow. Uh, so this is just from Wikipedia. This is in different languages, right? This was first nominally first discovered in 32 by zip uh, in English, but it has been repeated in every non-hieroglyphic langu language that we know of. And it's always the case that the n's most common word is one, uh, one over n as common as the most common uh, word, right? And so this is German, Russian, French, Italian, medieval, English. It's all, all the same, one over f type, type of behavior. Uh, the first time this law was actually discovered was not in the uh, in language. It was discovered in 1913 by another physicist, Auerbach, in the statistics of sizes of German cities. And so what he plots plot this curve, uh, population versus rank, uh, and it also is um, 1 over f, almost precisely. Now, if you multiply rank by the population, if it's, if it's really 1 over rank, then the product should be constant. And this is a product. The solid line is the product, right? It very quickly becomes a constant, suggesting that the tail of this distribution is, the, again, the zip floor. And then on the top, this is from a more recent article, distribution of firm sizes uh, versus, you know, so frequency versus rank for firm sizes. It looks like the slope is minus 2. It's really crazily plotted in this paper, but it's minus 2 because they put in uh, not even bin sizes, right? So please trust me that this is really one over rank. It's really zip, zip, zip flow. Uh, so it shows up everywhere. And there are many, many different reasons for why it does. There is, you know, this field is now 80, 90 years old. People have proposed different mechanisms for that. So what we are proposing is a slightly different mechanism and slightly different interpretation. The idea is that, again, we're not really interested why it emerges, at least for this part of the talk, but we're telling us that if it emerges, it means that the system has something interesting going on inside it. And specifically, there should be an emergent law somewhere there. Okay. Um, so let's restate the zip floor. Uh, this is the only slide which we are going to, which are going to have equations in it. Uh, and I know that some of you are physicists, and so that's for you, and some of you are not, and we can just skip the slide. But the point is that, again, the zip flow says that the probability of observing a particular word, which I call sigma in this particular case, is one over the rank of that particular word, right? And there is an elegant mathematical um, um, mathematical experiment, mathematical um, uh, this, this derivation that says that if you were to uh, define the what we call in physics microcanonical entropy, some of you know what that means, right? Uh, and and then I would calculate the entropy at a particular energy. Then the zip flow implies that the entropy and energy for 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 this for this words are exactly the same up to a constant which goes down, which which uh, up to a constant with n, which doesn't change when the system size grows, right? So if you can calculate entropy and energy and they're equal, you're going to get a zip flow. And there is what we have realized. This is a very simple picture, and now we can generalize it to a large, to much larger classes of problems, is the following. That if you have uh, the problem that I wrote down for you with the velocity, which is conditionally independent given the velocity of that particular block, right? If you have an external latent variable, as we call it, h, and you don't observe it, and conditional on that h, all of the uh, spins, all of the variables, all of the sigmas, all of the observable things are independent from each other, then there is a pretty simple uh, derivation, which I'm not going to tell through, but those of you who can follow it can, can just follow it while I'm talking, there is a pretty si simple derivation that tells you that you will get a situation that the entropy is going to be equal to energy. For this type of system, entropy this way defined and energy this way defined are going to be equal to each other and you're going to get a zip flow. So basically the statement is that if the data is, uh, uh, can be approximated with that expansion that I, with that approximation that I put before, that the total joint probability distribution can be written down as a distribution of the unobserved latent variable and then all other variables independent 
conditional on that one, then you are guaranteed to have zip flow. Right? It's a, so far, it's an if statement, not, not only if, but it's an if statement that tells us that maybe, maybe if you are observing a zip flow, this actually tells you that the system has a latent description. Okay? And so that's what something that we want to run with and see where we can, can go. Right? And in fact, um, in more recent work, we have shown uh, that um, it's not just an if statement, but it's physicists only if. So we don't have a proof, but we have done enough simulations to convince ourselves that, uh, that uh, it's if and almost only if, right? Meaning that uh, it's very, very difficult for you to have a situation where you have uh, the zip flow and this comes from something, zip flow and specifically which becomes better and better as the system size grows. Right, these words go from five letters to six letters to ten letters in length, uh, and so you get better and better zip flows. So it's very difficult to get the zip flows that grow, become better with the system size, and have this due to a different mechanisms rather than having an external latent field which varies independently of the system. Right? So it's effectively now it's if and only if statement that if you observe this, then it means that there is at least part of the data is explainable in terms of an effective model. I don't know what that model is going to be, but, and it will maybe not explain everything, but at least part of this data is going to be explainable in terms of the latent model. And then after that, we did, once we realized that, we tried to figure out what other features latent models would show, uh, would, would, uh, would, would, would actually, how they would manifest in data. So for example, for some of you, for some specialists, right, uh, you can look at these neurons in this uh, hippocampal recording that I showed you and uh, try to correlate spatial correlations between these neurons or try to calculate temporal correlations between neurons. And they show weird power laws and they show precisely the power laws which we can calculate in this latent style models and it's a one-to-one -one map, right? Uh, we also can do something what physicists know and love from the middle sort of, of 20th century, something called renormalization group, which is what is designed to extract relevant features from large models, right? So that's what physicists developed specifically to extract relevant degrees of freedom from large, from large models. And so we can try to do this on this type of data, like specifically on that hippocampal recording, and we show that extracting those degrees of freedom with this particular called coarse graining is exactly consistent with the theory having an externally driven degree of freedom. Um, we can also show that this type of um, zip style laws will have something called avalanches. This is some of the same avalanches that you have uh, heard about, let's say, in sand piles or, or avalanches in the mountains, right? So the idea is that there is going to be a time when no neurons are firing for a while, and then suddenly a large group of neurons are going to fire. And you can try to understand what is the relation between how long this avalanche, this range, large group of neurons firing lasts, versus how big it is. How many neurons does it include, right? So the duration of an avalanche versus its size. And, and uh, this zip flow mechanism predicts a very specific exponents. And you know, again, for those who know in the, in the audience, this is called the crackling ex exponents. They, come, they follow from this theory very, very simply. And otherwise, to achieve them is very difficult in, uh, in other type of, of, of models. And we've now observed that in the brain and in some even in an, inanimate systems, as crackling exponents show up, presumably because there are these latent degrees of freedom that, that exist, right? So there, for each one of the statements, there, is, there are some papers now that this is, again, arguing that all of the things say, tell us that somewhere underlying the brain, there is a lower dimensional theory, right? So how would this lower dimensional theory look like? And, you know, we're physicists, we're theorists, we sort of do things on a piece of paper, and luckily there are also engineers and computer scientists, right? And so those guys don't bother with, let's prove something, let's understand something, let's derive something, they just train a model, okay? And so nowadays, this is actually easy. You can train a large um, artificial intelligence models. And so the idea is that you're going to get a, a recording from hundreds of neurons in your brain, and this point, the activity of the whole neuron 
uh, of the whole brain then can be defined as a point in a hundred dimensional space, right? How, how active is this neuron? How active is neuron number two? How active is neuron number three, number four, number five, and all the way, I said it's hundred, but it's actually thousands now, right? It's like the number gets doubled every year or so, right? Um, and so then you can sort of put all of these points in this hundred dimensional, thousand dimensional space and try to see whether the activity in that space actually populates the thousand dimensional space, right? Or it concentrates in certain manifolds, just like that para those parameters that we've seen for the lobster, right? So that the, even though you have a hundred dimensional, a thousand dimensional system, you can actually describe an activity by one parameter or two parameters wh where on that line or on that plane uh, the, the activity is, right? So is this algebraic, is this sort of clear the geometry of it, right? It's three dimensional space, but I could have a, a one dimensional object in three dimensional space, right? Even though I can specify points on this mark, on this pointer with three coordinates, x, y, and z, it's in fact a one dimensional object and the point and it can be specified, you know, where along this line you are lying, right? So the, 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 the distribution of points is simpler. Its object is one dimensional roughly, not three, right? And so this is what people do. And now it's really a cottage industry in neuroscience. Um, the, some of the first papers were uh, by Churchland, Sarah Sawyer, and so on. And I'm just putting a bunch of names here, not just in neuroscience. The names in the second line are in ecology, in um, 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 protein, uh, protein structure and protein function prediction and so on. But this is basically what you do, um, what the idea is that, that activity of individual neurons is basically determined by your position in this lower dimensional subspace of the space, right? This is what this, uh, the, the, the figures on the left are supposed to, to show. And this is what you get if you take a big neural network and you train it on the real, real data and you ask it to identify those low dimensional features, right? And so here, this is experiment. Let me ex explain it in a second. There is a poor monkey that sits there. It has a joystick. It has eight directions in which it can move its, its joystick, right? And it has, gets a go cue, move your arm, and there is a light somewhere, and it knows that when I see a light, I need to go left, right? If I see it's a different light, I need to go right. And there is electrodes in its brain, it's recording 300 plus neurons, so it's now a 300 dimensional space, and we're going to try to figure out how the trajectory, as the animal moves its arm, how does the point in space defined by activity of the 300 neurons, how does it move in the 300 dimensional space? And can I write it down as something simpler? And it turns out you can actually write it down as a three-dimensional object, right? And so different colors correspond to moving in different dimensions. And this is the same figure just from three di from two different angles, just to, to show you what this thing, like these bundles look like. So the three-dimensional bundles going through the space of uh, activations capture 90-some percent of variance of the of, 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 of neural activity in this model. And this data is from Pandarinas' paper. And I preferentially chose this one, could have chosen all of the other ones because he is also in, in, my, in my university, so I'm promoting that, right? Um, so interestingly, what this means is the following, that if you follow the current machine learning literature, one of the most common architectures in, in the modern machine learning is the general architecture of what's called encoder-decoder, right? We can do autoencoders, we can do variational encoders, et cetera, et cetera. But for example, the architecture which is underlying large language models is this encoder-decoder architecture where you are trying to look at the past sequence of uh, uh, text and uh, try to compress that sequence and then use the compression with some additional twist, attention, et cetera, et cetera, to predict which next word is going to come, right? So architecture kind of looks like this, where you have a lot of inputs and these inputs would be which word have you seen at which particular point in the sequence and a very large dimensional thing because a word is not just zero or one, right? There's 50,000 tokens in English, right? Uh, and then you compress this whole thing to a lower dimensional space, right? Which in large language models, depending on which one you're looking with is anywhere from 30 to 200 or something like that, right? And then you expand back to predict which particular word you're going to see following it, right? And so if you look at it and stare at it, you realize that this is precisely the architecture that tells us that uh, we are looking for a, not just an ability to predict from my data, right? But we are looking for an ability to predict, to first find a lower dimensional model of this data and then use that lower dimensional model to predict things that we care about. 
So the mere fact that uh, encoder-decoder arch architectures actually work, right, and sometimes remarkably well, tells us that the world on, in which they work is actually much simpler than it could have been. That the dimensionality of language is not billion dimensional, it's only a couple hundred, right? What did that mean to have dimensionality of language? I don't know, but, but it's much simpler than it could have been, right? And so one needs to be a bit careful uh, that because the uh, when for a computational person or for a statistician, working usually means, oh, I captured 90% of variance, you know, R squared of 0 0.8, 0 0.9, right? If I captured 90% of what goes on in my brain in a model, I would not be able to walk, right? I really need to capture 99.999999 many, right? Just think about it. If you have a computer with registers on the processor and you make a mistake 10% of the time, that computer is not going to compute anything, right? So same story here. So one needs to be a bit careful. What people in this field call success is not necessarily full success, but at least it's an indication that we're on the right track, that the models that are much simpler than they could have been, just trained straightforward with off-the-shelf algorithms, are discovering for us that the world is simpler than it could have been. Okay? And of course, on this data sets, which I showed last time, we also run our analysis. We did find that there are bases, databases, the flow, and so on and so forth. So everything is consistent, right? So now, um, the last uh, few minutes, I'm going to stop on, on, on this very vague thought that I have at this, at this point and, and just try to maybe lead you to, to something, but I don't have full answers, right? So why it is that the world is sort of robustly simple, right? Why it is that we look at this biological networks and again and again and again we see that we can either in a model-free way detect that they have low-dimensional structures, the zip flow is a signature of that and some other things, or we can train an encoder-decoder and it works, right? Why it is that, that the biology is so much simpler than it could have been, right? And my train of thought here is the following, that biological systems, at least the one that I showed you, they are all um, built from large networks, right? It's a large network of neurons talking to each other. It's a large network of genes talking to each other, right? Um, it's a protein itself, a single protein is actually a network of interactions between amino acids, but then proteins also interact with each other. So there's a huge, uh, just astonishingly large networks with million and million um, nodes interacting with each other. And um, these networks are determined by what's called a connectivity matrix, right? So I's neuron talks to the J's neuron with a certain strength, right? So this quadratic object, who talks to whom? And uh, matrices, um, when especially they get very large, are known to have interesting properties. So, for example, everybody is familiar with uh, a simple law of large numbers central limit theorem that if you add a lot of things together, random things together, you get a Gaussian distribution. And it pretty much doesn't matter which things you're adding together, as long as they have finite variances, you're going to get a Gaussian. Same story works for matrices. You get very large matrices, you populate their number, their entries, with whatever numbers that you put in, sampled from some specific and quite robust, not very specific, but some classes of distributions. And then the properties of the matrices turn out to be extremely well defined, even though individual entries are random, right? The determinants, eigenvalue spectra, everything turns out to be well-defined. <coughs> so this idea we've seen in physics before, and I think that this is, going forward, I think this is one of the reasons why we have the slow dimensional descriptions. But we've seen this idea before. This is a classic picture, which I think many of you have seen, and if not, this is an indication that we are theoretical physicists are not teaching one of the most beautiful and, to me, one of the most important parts of the 20th century physics, the random matrix theory, right? Um, so what's plotted here is the following. Um, you look at heavy atoms, heavy nuclei, and you look at the spacing between um, uh, levels in, the, uh, in this nuclei, excitation levels in the nuclei. And here it's about a hundred different, or a thousand different nuclei that are put together. Um, and you get this histogram, which you see in the background, and then the line uh, above this. This is what's called Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. This is uh, basically if you have a random Hermitian matrix, because remember now we're talking about quantum mechanics, interactions of things in the nucleus, quantum mechanics, right? So, but now we're going to say that 
heavy nucleus has a lot of parts to it, and these parts interact randomly, but hermitianly. And if you do this, you get this particular curve. And for comparison, Poisson distribution is very, very different, which is what you would expect from if you were just adding things at, at random, right? So this was noticed by um, uh, Wigner, and then Dyson did a lot of calculations on this, derived some of these properties and so on. And since then, this whole field has matured into the field of uh, what's called random metric theory. The point is that a lot of uh, the same central limit laws that we know for individual numbers apply to matrices, but because matrices are more interesting, you get more interesting laws out, not just a simple gauge, right? And so my thought is that something similar is going on with, with our brains, with our um, uh, with other networks, right? You're putting in a lot of connections and some features, of course, are going to be very particular, right? So, of course, uranium is different from polonium, right? But some collective properties are still similar, right? The over, overall spacing between spectra is, are the same. And of course, different plants in our example are going to be different from each other, but they are still tropical plants and they have some similar, you know, some interesting features that uh, they can get water out of the air because they're in the tropics or something like that, right? And so um, we tried to look at one particular experiment and see if we could explain the observations in that experiment with this idea of random matrices, right? And so I'm going to walk you through this experiment in, in the next few minutes. So here we have a mouse. And the mouse is uh, in front of a screen. And again, the skull is removed and we're recording from the neurons. But here what we are uh, doing, we're separating two different types of neurons. Excitatory neurons, which if they fire, they're going to activate other neurons around them. And inhibitory neurons. So excitatory are green, inhibitory are red. Inhibitory, if they fire, they suppress all the activity around them. And so. Um, then this animal gets cues, and the cue is a simple sequence, Poisson sequence of clicks. And if the sequence is 10 hertz on average, then the animal should go to the left. If the sequence is 20 hertz on average, animal should go to the right. And of course, when you just heard a couple of clicks, you don't quite know whether it's a 10, click, a 10 hertz sequence or 20, right? You only heard three clicks and it could be one, could be another. So it takes an animal some time to get enough evidence and make a decision. And as they are doing this, <coughs> the experimentalists are recording from these neurons. And they build a model of the system, which explains the behavior of this animal. And the model basically says that there are excitatory neurons of type 1, which corresponds to the left choice, excitatory neurons of type 2, which correspond to the right choice, inhibitory neuron for each pair of them. And there are all of these arrows of connections in a very specific way. And then you can get the behavior uh, that would be uh, corresponding to what the animal to what the animal does. It would, if it would make the decision at just the right time as the animal does make the decision. It would make it with a certain error, the same as the animal does. And you would be able to predict it with the same accuracy by, by recording this group of neurons versus that group neurons of neurons. Right? The, the weights associated to different groups would have a certain probability distributions, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So this model works. And we ask, you know, do you really need a model which is as detailed as this one? So does this structure uh, in this system, right? This is a pretty low dimensional structure given that I'm, it's complex, but it's pretty low dimensional that I am recording from 300 neurons. Can it just show up by itself? And so what we did is something very naive, which we honestly didn't think would work, but it did, right? So we designed the network with 80% oh, yeah, excitatory neurons, 20% inhibitory neurons, just like in real life. Uh, put a couple of additional constraints in it, which we know must happen biologically, that you know, excitation inhibition is balanced so that the network activity can kind of per, per, re, re, reverberates for a long amount of time, either doesn't explode or doesn't die out, and a few additional con constraints. And so this is simple equations where neurons talk to each other. There is this, this is, sorry. This is that coupling matrix that I said, right? So which neuron is going to talk to which neuron? This object J is the matrix. Uh, and we put random numbers in that matrix subject to the constraint that excitatory neurons are only excitatory. So all of their connections to other neurons are positive and inhibitory are only inhibitory. So all of their connections to others are negative, but which beyond that, no constraints, just random things. And then we simulated those networks and we tried to do a computational experiment on them, exactly the same experiment as those folks did on their mouse in, in real life. 
And what we got is that, for example, that this is different instances of our networks, we were able to predict that the animal in this particular case should go left or right with, you know, 85, 90% probability. You can see all of these plots, and this is the numbers, right? 80% if I only look at inhibitory neurons, 75 if I only look at excitatory neurons, 90 if I look at both. And this is our computational numbers, and the numbers in the experiment were exactly the same. Right? Then I looked at the things, like remember I told you, that we are trying to predict where the animal would go. We are going to weigh uh, activity of different neurons with different weights. We can plot the distribution of those weights. This is our distribution of neurons, um, <coughs> of weights. This is theirs, and you will see that they are basically the same, right? Because this is a cumulative distribution. That's a true distribution. Uh, so the, that peak in, in, in that case corresponds to this flat line over, over here. But otherwise, these two distributions are the same. And uh, so the point is that uh, every single re recording that these people have done, this very simple random model reproduces, right? So random model develops this low-dimensional structure of E, I neurons talking to each other in a certain way, just, you know, that's the central limit result for this type of networks. That's what it looks like, right? And in fact, we can actually do this. I'm kind of a bit late, so I'm going to skip this. We really did the uh, random matrix calculation for this network, plot its IG spectra and all that, and this is what this plot is supposed to show, that indeed this is what happens, that there are... Uh, this low dimension, dimensional activity patterns that emerge in these networks. And then this is all without training. And then when you train these networks, when you do learning, right, what really happens is that this low dimensional activity manifolds, they get morphed, uh, morphed, right? Like they get shaped to do something what, what you need them to do rather than some random activity, right, being, being on this manifold, right? So the manifolds get are created for you by just random structures in the, um, in the connectivity pattern, and then training actually shapes them a bit in a way so that they are just the ones that you want to have, right? So now remember what I told you earlier, that uh, babies learn how to walk, right? And that's the biggest indication that we actually are simpler than we could have been, right? And now we're starting to see this, that there is this, again, low dimensional structures and morphing one low dimensional structure into another. So learning how to walk is a much simpler task than shaping up a low dimensional structure for walking, right, periodic motion of your legs out of an uncorrelated weird activity of individual neurons, right? And this is what I'm probably going to end with. Uh, so sort of the parting thought, the summary of what I tried to tell you today is that uh, Simplicity and laws in physics, and I also think in biophysics, is basically a statement that the data that you have uh, must have low-dimensional latent descriptions, latent variable descriptions. And those low-dimensional latent variables are the things that we are going to be calling effective degrees of freedom, right? coarse-grained degrees of freedom, which is how we write our physical theories. And these models are very hard to find in biology with existing theoretical tools. Zip flow and a few other things that I point that I sort of briefly pointed out, uh, they are model-free signatures that this underlying low-dimensional structures actually exist. I don't need to know the model to figure out that there is a low-dimensional structure. I can just look at the data. Zips is everywhere in biological data. Wherever you, you poke, it's there. Um, and uh, we can, in fact, do machine learning to extract some of these models, right? And why? The slow dimensional descriptions, maybe, and that's where I'm not so certain, but maybe it's because the, this, the, there are some ideas from random metric theory that force the slow dimensional descriptions to actually exist. And so, you know, of course, one can, you know, ask, do I really believe that the brain is random? You know, I would hope mine is not, right? It's, uh, uh, but, but it's a good starting point. I think it's a better starting point than, um, that, than, than the um, other starting point from which theories start approaching um, models of the systems. And so my hope is that this latent features models, once we start taking them a bit more seriously, they will allow us to build theories of brain without neurons, right, or theories of evolution without genes, just like we can have theory of hydrodynamics of water without relying on molecules, right? And so that would be a real emergence once we actually figure this out, how to do this, and that's, you know, one person is not going to do this, this is a whole field, right? And so with that I'm going to end. Thank you.
Thank you. Ilya, thank you very much for this lecture and for uh, helping us uh, shape some perhaps surprisingly simple and yet very complicated systems that are in the room into, into um, more sophisticated, at least better learned uh, shapes. So, so to, uh, to, to help with that further, we'll uh, uh, throw this open to questions. Uh, so I will call for questions. Questions. Um, so you get Zipp's law from a Shakespearean play, but don't you also get Zipp's law if I write a play by plucking letters completely randomly, independently? How, uh, how do you, from such a curve, tell me whether there's Shakespeare behind it or nothing? Uh, if you just put letters completely independently, you don't, right? What you need to do is you need to put letters completely independently and then um, either force yourself to have different grammatical, uh, so syntax, uh, whatever, different uh, parts of speech, and assume, and, and, and so you sample from that. Or if you put a space as a letter, uh, which delimits, which creates words of different lengths, right, uh, then you would get a zip floor in this, in this system. It's still not Shakespeare, but it, what, but it still means that there is actually an underlying simple, simple structure there, that a structure of, a, in the first case, part of speech, or in the second case, the word duration. Right? So uh, what's responsible for the emergence of this of the zip flow there is that there is this parameter that you can assign to every word, which is its length. Right? And so it, of course, does not describe the beauty of language, but it tells you that there are words of different lengths, right? Which is already an interesting observation if I didn't know anything about words of, you know, how, how long they could be, right? And so in this type of uh, biological data, I would, sim I would settle for the simple-ish facts like, you know, there are parts of speech, right? Or there are words of different lengths or yet something else, right? That said, um, I, I think I'm a bit underselling this, right? Because the... Uh, the type of be behavior that you, um, that you that you are uh, referring to, you will still get a zip flow in those situations. But zip flow is not going to become better as you look for longer and longer sequences from your sentence. It will be a zip flow starting from when the sequence, sequence, sequences become longer than a word. And it's not going to become better and better and better if you were to look at longer sequences, right? And, and here it does. And I think that this is an indication that there is more interesting... Oh. So if I, were to if I were to define my words as not just from space to space, but just a sequence of letters, I would not get a zip floor as I increase the length of the, sequ of the, of the letters, length of the sequences, right? So, in your example, if you have a space and you have random um, letters between the space and the word is between the spaces, you get the zip flow, right? But if I say that I'm going to look at, I'm going to define the word as a three letter combination, and then a four letter combination, and then a five letter combination, and I'm going to plot frequency versus rank for all of these combinations up to six, 10, 20, et cetera, et cetera, I'm not going to get a zip flow. Right? And that's, I think, the difference which says that we are some, something that goes on here in biology is slightly different. All right. Another question? Uh -huh. what? It's. You said you got up to a success rate of roughly 90% yeah. with your... Not, not me, but... Well, engineers, computer scientists, all of with those people, right? A few parameters, which is yeah. significant, but not, you know, full success. How do you yeah. know it's not going to take all of the other parameters to get you to the full 99.99%? Uh, I don't. Um, and I think this is also okay, right? So let's go back to the um, fluid dynamics example, right? We say that velocity is a simple, simpler description than just the velocity of individual particles. But in reality, velocity is a field. 
and uh, I can take it Fourier transform, and I can have spectral um, spectrum of this of this field, right? And what you will notice is that uh, on lower frequencies, the low, lo long wavelengths, the amplitudes are large, and as you go to very high wavelengths, uh, very short wavelengths, high frequencies, amplitudes are going to become small. So higher and higher frequencies are progressively less important, right? contribute less to the um, to the underlying uh, this physical description, right? Uh, and that's what we are observing in this um, in um, um, the neural recordings, right? You add more features, and your accuracy still keeps on going up. At some point, it doesn't because we just ran out of data. But it, but it's probably the case that if we got more data, it would still keep going up. But each next component adds less and less interesting, less and less predictive power, right? And so what this suggests to me is that, uh, again, in somewhat technical term, right? In physics, we have two different types of coarse-grained theories, right? Some of them have a gap, meaning that there is a specific degree of freedom on a particular scale, and then nothing else matters. You can just throw away, and you can just start from there, right? Just a few degrees of freedom. And then the other theories don't have a gap, and you have this beautiful continuous spectra uh, going on from you know, low frequencies uh, to, to high frequencies, right? Theories are still simpler in that the power at the tail gets to be smaller and smaller as you, as you go further and further in the tail. They're still simple, but not in that simple way where you just cut and you can say that this is a full description, right? And my personal opinion, and this is what I've been arguing in a couple of recent articles, is that one of the reasons why straightforward machine learning applications to biological data is not going to work is precisely because of what you're saying, right? Is that it's not going to be the case that there is a gap that once you've reached so many degrees of freedom, you're done, you've explained everything. You, know, you will still need to be adding piece by piece by piece more and more and more. It's just that each next piece is going to be less important. Yeah. I guess sort of um, going on from those question, um, if it is the case that um, we, you know, we, we are products of evolution, if it is the case that we need sort of all of the degrees of freedom, as it were, to completely describe, as you sort of said in the beginning, you need really, really high accuracy to be able to walk, right? You know, if you get something a bit wrong, you're probably just going to fall flat on your face. You need really, really high accuracy to walk. And because we're products of evolution, I might be inclined to believe that if there were a simpler way of getting there, we might have, we might be there in a sense that this is probably, we might be at the most sort of low dimensional model as it were do you think in a sense that these sort of models that you're talking about where we can reduce down to low dimensions are in some sense just a, a stepping stone whilst we sort of eventually develop a capacity to compute sort of fully exactly what's going on because only then perhaps will we have a full description of of how brains etc work okay let me I, I'm, I'm going to answer the question in the way that you probably don't want me to answer it right and so if I, i'm going to latch on the last few last words and, and go from there, right? Um, what is a full theory of the brain, right? What is a full theory of this glass? Very simple object to some extent, but what is a full theory of this glass, right? I know that if I drop it, it's gonna fall down with 9.8 meters per second squared. That's a full theory of something, right? Uh, if I drop it, it's gonna crack. That's a theory that uh, is material science now rather than um, 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 Newtonian mechanics, right? I know it if I heat it, put it in a or whatever on a, on, a, on a stove, it's going to heat up. That's thermodynamics, right? And what you will notice is that we never have a full theory of this class. We have theories that des describe specific phenomena, specific aspects, specific views of this class, right? So I do not think that a full theories are useful. I don't think that they exist, right? What was that quote by? Um, um, uh, Binner and Rosenblum is that the best material model of a cat is another, preferably the same cat, right? You you cannot reproduce a cat by, except by another cat, right? And if I wanted to have a model of a human, we actually know, all know how to make a model of another human. You know, just make babies. That's a model of another of a human, right? That's uh, 
uh, so it's uh, useful for something, but not, but not. I don't think for understanding, right? So I don't think that that the that the the, the full the ideas of like full theory of something just doesn't exist, right? And so I don't think that we will have a full theory of the brain. We will have, a, uh, and it doesn't make sense to me. We will have a theory that can explain to us what will happen in a certain context. Like you know, you're trying to learn to walk. That we can actually. Like right now, in a different talk, I can explain how we model how we learn to walk or just acquisition of uh, uh, motor tasks like bird singing, which is actually very similar to fine tasks like, like walking, right? And that I'm pretty sure we're going to have reasonably good theories of. We almost have them now. But the full theory of the brain, I'm not interested in that one, right? <laughs> You know how at the start you mentioned with the crabs and how there are lots of different ways of getting very similar behavior? Yes. Have you noticed in your experiments that different individuals or even the same individual doing the same thing a few times does it in a way that seems fundamentally different but macroscopically shows similar results? So first of all, experiments are not mine. None of the experiments I showed are mine, right? They're always collaborators. I don't run a wet lab. I tried this once and it didn't turn out to be pretty. So, um, so I, don't, I don't do that. Uh, um, so in the lobsters, people have now done this, right? The uh, Eve Marder, uh, that's her big program now and you know, adaptation in the circuits, right? And so adaptation is to things like uh, temperature in the water in you know of Boston, um, and how does that affect you know animal that circuit learns how to like crabs are um, they're cold blooded right uh, so they really are dependent on the temperature. Uh, in this uh, birds in the experiments, what we we cannot pull out microscopic parameters right. This is a brain of a live animal. We just cannot do this. But what we do know is that we can. Mm -hmm take the same bird and make it learn a single, you know, pitch shift, pitch change in the pitch in a, in a, in a syllable by shifting the, the, what it hears through the headphones, then we can remove that. And then we can ask the bird learn it again and learn it again. And every single time it learns it slightly differently, actually sometimes faster, sometimes slower, depending on the time delays and so on and so forth. But we can model that difference, right? We actually understand that quite well. So I'm not sure if it's correct what you wanted to hear, but have you seen any examples of these sorts of gap theories in the biological system they study where if you look at the distribution then there's a sort of distinct point where it doesn't follow this, this power law behavior and it just kind of abruptly ends and that extra complexity seems redundant right um I mean, yes and no, right? Um, so the Hashing Huxley model itself is a, has a pretty good gap, right? Um, it, it is still a very reasonable model of, uh, with a few twists of uh, signal propagation in, the, um, in neurons, right? Um, there is a recent theory by Olga Dudko of uh, synaptic um, T model is um, can that we should part be affecting us. And it's just better. Oh, no. Yeah, it's just done. Now. Well, thank you. Um, uh, which is also basically has a gap, right? They explain um, uh, many types of synapses, and not just neural synapses, but things like release of insulin from um, ins insulin granules in beta cells with a theory which has just a handful of parameters to the accuracy which makes me think that you do not need much one, right? There is never a gap which is incredibly large, but 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 I think that some of these examples have a reasonably large gap, right? As a known physicist but a chemist, I'm gonna ask a really chemist question. Huh? Where do you see this going in 10, 20, 50 years? What kind of applications would you expect to be for, you know, all of us mortals? Ah, you know, this is something that I 
keep asking myself all the time, right? It's, I, I have a very enviable occupation where somebody pays me for solving puzzles, right? Um, I honestly have no idea what the current AI revolution is going to do to that. Um, if you were to ask this to me a few years ago, um, I would have guessed that driving a truck is harder or easier, sorry, than um, writing a poem. Uh, but it turns out it's not, right? So I, uh, it's it's much harder. Right? Walking is actually much harder than writing a poem. Um, so I just don't know. I'm afraid to make predictions because that's something that is like always in the back of my mind. Um, how long do we have till till we're obsolete? Right? <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, it's 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 gonna be okay. <laughs> I I think it's gonna be okay, but some of the not not for all of us. <laughs> but yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but some of the boring things may actually turn out to be the, the, the hardest to replace. Right. So I was just curious. Uh, in the beginning, you motivated some of the difficulties in biology by comparing it to the fluid dynamics or, or a gas example. And um, one of your points was that you don't have this uh, intrinsic sense of locality that uh, you have uh, uh, in terms of real space uh, in, in the fluid dynamics. And I was wondering if uh, you can get a similar... Uh, maybe more discrete, but sense of locality, maybe from the connectivity graph, or whether a sense of locality might emerge from the latent model. And uh, I guess the wider question is, is this even interesting? Uh, or, and does it gain you something? Because then you can talk about the smoothness of your control field, or is it just ir irrelevant in the biological case? Yeah, so uh, let me... There is no sense of locality, that's true, right, for most systems. But... Um... I don't think that locality by itself is that, uh, like we, we view it, it, it's definitely one of the most important things for building physical models like we know of. But um, Linoy Michelam, in one of her papers, she made a proposal which I really liked. And the proposal was that let's not define locality by who is close to whom spatially, but define locality by who is close to whom in terms of activity. So we're going to calculate correlations and activities. We're going to calculate our mutual information between activities and the strength of this correlation is going to, we're going to define this as locality, right? And of course, in a truly local system, you are interacting with your neighbors and you're going to be strongly correlated with them. So it becomes the same thing, right? Defining locality by space versus by the strength of correlation is the same thing, right? Um, but she just took it to the next to the next step and 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 define locality this way. And then she did Kadanov's RG, which of course we know requires locality. Um, but she did it on that system with locality defined through correlation and it worked quite well. They discovered a non-trivial fixed point and all of those things. And I think that this is where some of these approaches will go to more more formally, right? Then we later we showed it was exactly the same way that the non-trivial fixed point is the point that you will discover in a model with latent variables, right? So that's what they basically discovered, right? But 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 people know how to beat it, right? I think that that's the message, right? We locality is crucial, and we need to rethink what local means. And some people have already rethought what local means. Um, you mentioned the central limit theorem and like replicating, uh, like not replicating, but creating a random uh, network or of a matrix with some constraints to replicate the behavior of the mouse's brain. Yeah. But is it significant that it's a biological system, or wouldn't you replicate the results anyway in whatever situation because you have so many input variables that somehow lead to a normal distribution? Is it like biologically significant? I think I understand what you mean, so I can try to answer it. If not, please interrupt me, right? So I think that there were a couple of things that made this really a model of a biology, biological system, okay? Uh, so it was random with constraints, right? And so the constraints were that we have this 80-20 excitatory inhibitory balance. And 80-20 is not that important, but the fact that there are substantially more excitatory neurons than inhibitory was crucial. Right? Um, then there is something called excitation inhibition balance, meaning that I have 20% of neurons that are inhibitory, 
but they interact with more neurons in the system so that overall the strength of inhibition is balanced to be the same as strength of excitation. That's good. To achieve this, you would need to have local adaptation where every neuron just sort of looks around, measures the excitation inhibition that comes into it, and, and adjusts itself to pay more attention to one or the other, right? So we know that this actually does happen in biology, but that's a, not a trivial thing. If I were to just put a random network uh, with no adaptation, this would not happen, right? Uh, this is, by the way, what also happens, something very similar mechanism is in the um, power grids, right? There's uh, this adaptive uh, issues, adaptive con balancing between uh, dumping electricity into the network and removing it from there, right? And so uh, you, 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 you need this type of constraints in human engineered distribution networks, right? Um, there were other constraints uh, that we needed to put in uh, that the, some diversity of these neurons, that you know, how many synapses does each one of them have, uh, which we tried to get from real literature and things like that, right? And so just randomly putting in an interaction network, we would not get that, right? So the, it's not that, again, the same thing that I said before, it's not that details don't matter, right? Some very biologically important details actually matter very much, or you will not get this, but not everything. Right. right, well, uh, thank you, Ilya, and uh, we're not finishing yet, but uh, before we move to a few more items that we need to cover, uh, let's thank the speaker again for uh, <laughs> it. Thanks.